when they sent me that contract, alarm bells started ringing. It was obvious what they were trying to do because it's very, very smart. They would have robbed you fully, basically. Fully. Yeah. The whole company, if I'd have just signed that paper, they would have legally kicked me out of the company. I'd have left been zero. They would have ran her. So you're almost like robbed of your 10 million yeah. pound company. That's yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So, um, That's crazy. What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to CEO Cost, the number one podcast in the world for showcasing business entrepreneurship. Now, today, you lot join me on a special episode, a special story to be had, because I'm joined with one and only Ash White. Thank you, bro. How you doing, my friend? Yeah, good man. Thank yeah. you for having me on. Good uh, f- um, train down here. Yeah, not too bad. <laughs> yeah. So, before we get into this episode, um, you know, there's a lot to unfold here and a lot to yeah, uncover bro. about your story. You know, you sent me a voice note last night and I was just like, raw, this, this yeah. guy's story, <laughs> he's a legend. And the fact that, you know, you're, you've been through it and you're still standing here today right now is incredible, right? Um, anyone would have done anything in those sort of situations. Yeah, you've got to have strong, strong mentality to get through it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so before we get into it, founder of Hero. Yep. Yep. Uh, what's like your biggest accolades and biggest achievements? Probably when I was 19 at rock bottom, girlfriend broke up with me at the time. Yeah. And then having the mental strength to get out of that hole where you're 19, lost, suicidal, um, and to like have that drive and self-belief, turn that depression into self-belief and stuff like that to really start Hera. Yeah. And that's probably my biggest achievement. Really think back like how I felt then to like what I've gone and done. Yeah. I'd say that's my biggest achievement. How old are you now? 28. 28 okay, so that's like almost 10 years on. 10 years. Yeah. yeah so how long were you running here for? Because you sold, we'll get into this whole, everything, yeah, you know, the whole story recently, yeah. but you sold it to Paul Richardson, yeah. who was at the time at Gymshark, the COO? No, he was the, I don't know, he was just one of the directors, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, you got Steve Hewitt, who was the CEO, and then I think Paul was, yeah, like operations or something like that. Yeah. Okay, fair <clears> play. <throat> so let's dive all the way back then. Here are clothing, right? Yeah. So what was your whole vision for starting this clothing line? Because you said, you told me you found a gap in the market, which yeah. nowadays the fast to look at a clothing line and I try and find a gap in the market for me, it would be pretty much impossible. Yeah, right? yeah. Because I wouldn't know where to start, what yeah. to do. So, so what was your gap in the market? So I was literally at uni at Liverpool for like three months. And whilst I was in the relationship, I was literally wanting to wear, I was literally wearing girls jeans because yeah. they were skin tight to the ankle. Yeah. And back then in Liverpool, like, everyone was wearing skinny jeans with like Nike trainers. Yeah. Because it showed the trainers better. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So then I went to Top Man and all that stuff. You couldn't find these jeans mm-hmm. anywhere. And then I just remember being inside. Wait, were you shopping in the men's section or the women's section? Men's. Okay, and yeah. then <laughs> Topshop had like Jamie jeans. Yeah. And they're sick. Yeah. And I was like, what? I couldn't wrap my head around why they don't sell these jeans. What's Jamie jeans? They're just like, um, it was a part of their jean collection. Like they've got like oh, okay. Jamie jeans, Jamie jeans. Oh, they're okay, massive okay. for women and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but they're just skinny jeans tight to the ankle and stuff. Yeah. So um, yeah, I just couldn't understand like why Top Man just didn't get that exact jean and just market it for guys because i knew like everyone was wanting this product yeah, so course, i just yeah. found a f- factory in birmingham went there made the jeans sampled it and yeah. then just i saw like influencer marketing was like going to be a big thing so yeah. i was like right i need to make this product put on shopify use instagram and geordie shaw yeah. and had gas from geordie shaw as the face of it from day one yeah um yeah and then obviously that was the that was the strategy so i had a great product which didn't exist in the market yet mm-hmm. so that was a massive advantage but the disadvantage i had was because they're jeans it's hard to like skip, like market it because like if, if Gaz wore jeans on George Shaw, like it's not like it's a massive t shirt with a big hair logo on where yeah. it has visibility. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I was trying to market a pair of jeans, but look, there's like a big logo on the back, but or it's quite the, rare on the, back of the jeans. on the back of the jeans. Yeah, um, yeah. Like further down the line, like Geordie Shaw and Big Brother and Love Island started cotton onto these jeans, so like they fucking start putting labels over it. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, they oh, hated God. it because <laughs> like whatever episode it was, like Love Island, they yeah. walk in with a pair of jeans on, and what and they just cut out the logo. They, basically, they, yeah, they, they they put tape on it on Big Brother and all that. So stuff. That eventually, like, took them a couple of years to cotton on. <laughs> <laughs> so that almost like cut out your whole marketing strategy, right? So to an extent, you... it's just yeah. At that point, when they started cutting it out, it was all over Instagram anyway. So yeah. it's like kind of it caught on by then. Yeah. yeah. How much did you start the brand with? Before we get into it, make sure you subscribe and set the bell notification to all so you never miss a single episode. So I had no money. So I dropped out of uni, got a job at Vodafone. I had literally no money. I was probably always in my overdraft, couldn't even afford fuel in my car. Yeah. Um, so then I did everything backwards because um, I knew I needed to find out. I went to Barclays Bank, so I, like, I want to start a business. They're like, okay, right, here's a form. You need to f- fill out this business plan, tell me how much you need. Mm-hmm. So I did everything backwards. So I went to, um, found a supplier in England, made samples of jeans, got costs for that. Yeah. Spoke to Gaz from Geordie Shaw, his manager. They said no constantly to begin with. And then they eventually sent me a contract over after like a month later of 
like just going back and forth, like literally almost begging them just like take into consideration. So then eventually they said, fine, we'll do it. And then um, sent me over the contract for like 12 months, for like two grand a month. And I still had no money, but I signed it anyway. Yeah. Because <laughs> I was like, I didn't want to like put them off. Okay, so yeah, yeah. I signed a two grand a month contract yeah. <laughs> with no money and then put on my business plan. Um, and then but built a Shopify website um, in Birmingham, got costings for that. So I had all the costings, went back to Barclays Bank. They're like, sorry, we can't do it and all this stuff. Went to Virgin Startup Loans. They're like, yeah, we, we can't, we're not going to do it. So then I literally had everything. Why, why were they rejecting it? Just for age. Like, okay. it's just like risky. It's just like, it's difficult. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny. One, one of the emails, I've still got the email from Virgin Startup Loans just saying my projections were like unrealistic and all this stuff, but I actually tripled the <laughs> projection in year one. So what was what it? I put down. Like the, the, the business plan that you showed them and whatnot? They I didn't... think so. They just said they didn't understand my marketing strategy. It made no sense because yeah. it was like all influencer based, yeah. but they didn't it wasn't even a thing like sort of so yeah it's a lot of combinations and stuff but um so then it got to the point where everyone was just like right we need i was like right i need this money everyone's asking me for the money now because <laughs> yeah. i knew i was always going to get the money so yeah. that's why i just spent the year doing it mm -hmm. so you know i spent 12 months with no money but with shit tons of self-belief knowing that this is just going to work out somehow mm -hmm. and even the, when the banks rejected me and stuff it didn't phase but it was just like motivated me even more so then it got to the point where i was like i was looking at online like every single possible way to get the money. So then eventually I spoke to my parents because I didn't want to speak to my parents because I wanted to do something for myself without anyone interfering or like having something over yeah, me sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. So what, I told what was them. That due to? Was that like pride and ego or? I, I just think I wanted to do it because I didn't tell anyone what I was doing for the 12 months. Yeah. Not even my parents, my friends, no, no one, one knew. knew. Okay. What but, about your girlfriend? Did she know? No, because my girlfriend at the time broke up with me before I started doing the hair stuff. Okay. So then it was like that time at the period going through the breakup where I was so driven yeah. <laughs> to like create the brand. So I didn't tell anyone. Okay, yeah. So um, did that. And then, um, yeah, so I spoke to my parents and they were like, no, like no chance because we just lived in a like normal council estate house. Yeah. Um, and then a week went by and then they sat back down in the limb room. They're like, look, Ash, we can't believe we're doing this, but we've remortgaged the house to give me the £25,000 loan. Mm -hmm. So they gave me the twenty five grand loan. Then it all became real pretty quick. Yeah. <laughs> Paid everyone. Then launched with guys from Geordie Shaw. And then, um, yeah, and then we made one sale on the first night, which didn't go to plan. Because you just think like, oh, they've got millions of followers. Yeah. You know, it's just going to pop off yeah. and all this stuff. But it's not the case. Um, and the jeans back then, when, when I launched, I think we priced them at like £120, mm -hmm. which was just like too expensive looking back for that market. And yeah. it wasn't until we lowered the price down to I think it was like £50. That's when it really popped off and okay. then, like in yeah in the first year that's like a an, drastic drop though in, in price yeah it's i got advice off like people in the industry and just like look your price point and your, your target market you're going after like young kids like 17 18 19 20 yeah. plus you like you need to be in that sort of bracket sort yeah. of thing you gotta think if they've got 120 in the first place it's better yeah than jeans. yeah so did that and then it just yeah we blew up like we did a million in sales in year one yeah which is crazy i mean you say a million in sales in year one which is crazy of course and you say, yeah, we just did it. It doesn't just happen like we just did it sort of no. thing, right? Yeah. So from that point, just, just to throw it back there for when you made that one sale initially, right? Mm -hmm. Overnight. How did that make you feel? Was It, it like didn't phase me. Like, because I was so like, my mind was just so like, I just knew it was always going to happen sort of thing. But you must have expected in that particular scenario that you, you'd get a whole load of sales come through and whatnot. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a, like, a reality check. Yeah. So it's just like, okay, this ain't going to be as easy as I thought. It's like, this going to take a lot of time, but yeah. it just, it's just snowballed. And then um, you, you had Aaron and Scotty T on there. And then all of a sudden, Gaz was basically saying, look, the, the lads are stolen my jeans out of my pack back. Like they're all, they're taking all my stuff. Like, yeah. can you send us loads of stuff out? Because all the lads want to wear them. Yeah. So they all wore them every episode. So that just started to grow and grow. And then we expanded onto like Towie. They all wore it. Then Love Island. Yeah. And then just like... And, Back then, 2015, 2016, like reality TV was gigantic. <laughs> so as much as that was like, you know, marketing, that was almost like natural word of mouth sort of thing as well amongst yeah. the celebrities. Yeah, because the time. product was sick. Yeah. Like it, this product was the best jeans yeah. you could possibly buy at that time. Yeah. Like, because everyone wanted them. And yeah. they, there was just such a gap in the market because I hated shopping for jeans back then because it's like they never fitted properly. Then like... It's That's just, like me now. I hate shopping for jeans now. Yeah. It was a specific yeah. area. And it's just like, yeah, I think that's why it worked. No, I'll get you. I want to throw it back to that one point you said, you know, your girlfriend and you had broken up before you'd started yeah. the brand. That that breakup, right? Did that, um, well, how long were you with her for? A year. A year. That was my first girlfriend. So that was your first girlfriend, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That breakup there, did it almost um, fuel you in a sense of, all right, 
everything else. I'm now chasing my brand, you know. I haven't got my girlfriend there. I've suddenly got this fueled from the breakup. Yeah. Um, because it's kind of like a natural thing to do. You know, if someone breaks up with a girl, they go pursuing other things yeah. to try and distract yourself from, you know, the breakup. Of yeah. course, because the last thing you want to do is dwell on the fact that, you, you know, you just yeah, want so to really like that. This episode is sponsored by Fireway Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK. With over 100 locations, you definitely have a store near you. The founder of Fireway was on the show not too long ago, and you can get a slice of the action by using the discount code CEOcast at fireway.co.uk. Once again, use the discount code CEOcast at fireway.co.uk. Really thinking back, like it ended, I didn't take it well. It's just, just like, I couldn't handle it. It's just, I didn't understand. Like I just, when you go from like being with someone every single day mm-hmm. to not at all, it's like almost like you're experiencing death sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like, it's a big thing. It's like breakups, like guys and stuff, it's hard to mm-hmm. deal with. Um, so yeah, it, I, back then I just, I was absolutely fucked. <laughs> like just couldn't handle it. So it was just like, yeah, it just, it just had to rebuild myself. Like it, it, all of the, it was literally that I was just like, right, just focus on yourself. And I, cause it, I genuinely had proper depression, like suicidal back then. It didn't for a long time for like, for like a year because Due of that breakup. Break, yeah. yeah. All because of the, like that breakup and stuff. Um, so I just literally set two goals, which was start a business again, the best shape of my life back then. So I spoke to Lewis Harrison, um, to make me a plan. So he coached me, joined the gym, um, and then literally my other uh, goal was start a business. And that's when I started doing the business plans, going to the bank on my own at 19, talking to them about businessy, yeah. <laughs> like doing all this stuff and go, go and I'd go to Vodafone, work t- nine to five, go to the gym till six. And I'd go home and I'd work from six till two in the morning every day on repeat. And I loved it. And it didn't feel like work. I was just like, like that. I found something where, you know, I pretty much replaced my girlfriend with the business sort of thing. So I was like, okay, this is where I'm going to put all my energy and focus on. No one can take it away from me. This is mine sort of thing. Like, yeah. and it was just like that sort of thing to like yeah, yeah, fix yeah. myself. Yeah. So I did, so I did that. And yeah, it's just um, used all that drive basically just to really do the That's business. That's what I'm saying. It's kind of like a natural thing to do. I know yeah. so many people who, who have gone through that sort of situation where yeah. they've broken up, not necessarily started a business, but they've got new jobs or they've got new things going on in their life or they're trying new things, new hobbies, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And whereas a business is it's pretty much a lifestyle at that yeah. point because, you know, you're living it in 24 seven, right? Yeah. What was the other reason why you didn't tell anyone else? Because when I was 19, I was uh, on YouTube, I was watching like, tons and tons of like Will Smith law of attraction stuff. Cause like he is so big on that subject and like the way he speaks about self-belief and all that stuff. I watched all his content and he just says, just don't tell anyone. You don't need to tell anyone because I was so wrapped in my own mind and my head with all this like universe stuff and law of attraction stuff and self-belief and believing that anything's possible sort of thing. Mm which is everything he teaches. And it generally almost changed my mindset. Absolutely completely. I think if I didn't watch his videos, I don't think heroin even exists because I wouldn't have had the self-belief in myself that it actually is possible to do something because the things he was saying, like, it's just like, he uses examples of like, you know, tens of like hundreds of years ago, like it was unrealistic for someone to walk into a room and switch a switch on and light bulb would come on. So like, if you think of really complex things like, okay, right, you need to build a massive building like, or build a plane to go over the world or whatever. Yeah. If you think how difficult that is, and then you think, oh, I want to start a clothing brand, which has already been done by loads of people. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's not, possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, Nothing's impossible then, Nothing's is it? impossible. So, like, if yeah. you believe, like, nothing's po- impossible, then it is possible sort of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, it was it was all that stuff. I listened to all this stuff, Conor McGregor, Jim Carrey, all that stuff. They all speak about the same yeah. thing, like, law of attraction and all that stuff. So, I fully believe in all that stuff and self-belief and stuff um so that's pretty much where that all that started from but then but then like how's that relate to you not telling other people so because that builds your self-belief uh, 100% with that because I, other page. people don't think how you think because okay. like there's no point in telling someone your goals and dreams when yeah. they've never one they've never done it themselves two they're not on that level of consciousness anyway yeah so it's just like i'm not gonna and people speak to other people to get um what's the word to get like clarification that their idea is good. And yeah. why would you do that? Like, it's the most pointless thing. Like you need to just do it for yourself. Yeah, and then for sure. no one believes you anyway. And there's, again, Will Smith did a really, really good interview on stage when like this white jacket sort of thing, if you want to watch that, where he just says like, no one believes, no, like you don't know who you are. So, and nobody knows who you are. Mm-hmm. So it's just like, until you go and do it for yourself, people think you're crazy anyway. Yeah, <laughs> It's not until you start getting your sales, you start to actually do it. Like when my friends and family, when they found out I was doing all this 
brand stuff with her and it launched with Gaz, my phone blew up. It's like, what the fuck? Like, where did this come from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not until you <laughs> do it and like they see it. Yeah. It's like, that's the best possible way to show them. It's like, once it's done, not you're going to do it sort of thing. Yeah, no, I get that. That's the same sort of thing. So you, you see with me and I've got like big podcasts coming on, right? Yeah. I don't tell anyone, not even the people who are, I tell like a couple of people who are part of the CEO cast team, no one else outside of that. And the reason for that is, is I just feel like every single person, I used to tell anyone who I'm doing a podcast, if yeah. Yeah, I've got a podcast with freaking Richard Branson coming on, yeah. never ever happens. Yeah. You know, uh, it's almost like it's jinxed. So yeah. I, from that point onwards, you know, when I done Tate, I never told anyone. Yeah. And I've got another big one coming up soon, hopefully. And I just won't tell anyone who it is. And everyone's yeah. asking me like, yo, like, when's the next pod- big yeah. podcast? I'm just like, I don't know when the next big podcast yeah, yeah. is. You know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. I might have to fly out for it. I don't know. But yeah, man. It's, it's one of them ones where, for me, it's not so much of other people having doubt in me. It's just, I just feel like it just messes up with the whole flow of things. Yeah. And you don't want to be infected by other people's negative yeah. because like it just distracts from your own mind. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> just focus on yourself and follow people. Even when I started the podcast, I didn't tell no one. Yeah. You know, they all found out naturally because they, yeah. they were on YouTube one day and they saw a recommendation from CEO Cast. Yeah. I remember my mate was in the car with me and he was like, what the f***? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh shit, yeah, put that away right yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, no, it's crazy, man. So back to Hero. What all happened after that you know you say you've done a million in the first year yeah as if it happened overnight and just like that i'm sure there was trials and tribulations that you had to it face. was it wasn't that bad like the, f- the first year because the, f- the first year was good because like we just had three products like it was just literally we launched with black jeans and we expanded on to blue jeans and different types of rips and we literally did a million off three products yeah <laughs> and that was it it was very simple it just we we grew so quick because the demand was gigantic like mm-hmm. we would we weren't even paying for stock up front because we had to put a system in place where you they had to pre-order the jeans okay. so like we had to put them on the website yeah and then we would have like i don't know five thousand orders or whatever okay and then it, it, they would have to wait eight to ten weeks eight to ten weeks for them to be made and then they would come in yeah and then we'd be sold out straight away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like we were never in stock because like, the demand was so high and we would like bootstrap it. So yeah. like we just used the pre-order method to like fund the, the whole the thing stock. and we just yeah, rapidly yeah, yeah. grew and they were happy to wait because so they had no ass to go. Like, you, as you explained around, it's kind of like you weren't, you know, you didn't have to invest your own personal money into the business. We wouldn't have been able to because we started with 25 grand. So like we ordered like, I think 300 pairs of jeans to begin with. But, yeah. and if you think in 12 months period, like how would you snowball that to a mill? Yeah. <laughs> like it requires a lot of stock. Of so it's just yeah. like, it was the pre-order stuff what enabled us to grow that so you, quick. Yeah, you essentially built up the hype, built up the name, built up the reputation. Yeah. And people were demanding it. The only downside to that year, what I can remember is I had a letter come through because I was still at my parents' house at the time and then had a letter come through. It was like, Spoke to him was like we've had a letter from Levi Strauss, Which you know, Le- Levi jeans. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> just uh, what they say. They're basically, we had like a label on our jeans, like yeah. it was just a black late tab thing with yeah. hair on it. But I knew, like, obviously, they had like the red tab, but didn't know like they trademarked the fact that you know you can't have any tab whatsoever on on your jeans okay. anywhere. So what did they want to do? Have like a actual case against yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. So we had to like settle with them and stuff. Yeah, which was crazy. How did that all unfold? Is can't go, could, yeah. I, I don't know if I can go too much into it, but yeah, we had to settle with them. It was like six figures. So it was just like, it was a lot. Um, but yeah, it's, it's crazy because like you think, you know, you're young, you're in a council state house, and then you're getting the biggest brand yeah. in the world sending you a letter. Which, <laughs> which is, is crazy. And you know what, as bad as it is, like, you know, the fact that you got to pay six figures and it's like, oh God, now I've got to deal with this case sort of thing. It was scary. It's scary, 100%, yeah. but it's almost like, all right, so they recognise who I am. Yeah. The biggest brand for jeans knows who. And who then we a are. year year later, we were next to them in Salvages. <laughs> so yeah, that's crazy. Like, See, this, that's what I'm saying. There's a whole lot to unfold. Yeah, yeah. In that first year, you know, you started the brand yourself, right? Mm-hmm. You didn't have no part. Of, no, it? no. Did you have any people working for you in the rest, like, the rest of the no, year? No, first year it was just me, and then eventually, like I know Black Black Friday came around, and I just had. Basically, the limb room looked like a bomb. It just like it just stacked to the ceiling. So you're still in your in your house, stocking everything at that point because we launched in April 2015. The first four to five months was like really slow. Like it was just like yeah. dead. This growth really came October when we shot with Leon Scott. Yeah. And then we brought out the new colors, and then it just like rapidly grown from October, November, Christmas period to April. Yeah. Um. But yeah, just send send out all the orders myself, going to post office, all that stuff, and then my friends and family would help pick and pack orders. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny looking back. Then we'd have like bo- boxes arrive with jeans and stuff, and it just yeah, it's crazy. So that year when you done the million, were you ready for that? Like uh, some some people may be listening to this right now. Million in review, big warehouse, 
you know, got X amount of employees. Yeah. Was it that? Was no, nah, I, mean, I think, so, I think so logically, like, and like back then I was like, okay, I knew it was coming. I was like, right, I can feel it. Like this is coming. We need to get someone across service. We need to, I, I was like, surely there's a thing where I don't have to get my own warehouse. I can just, it's called a 3PL. And yeah. this was like eight years ago, 10 years ago. And I Googled that and they found, oh, this is a 3PL. They can pick, pack and send out. So I phoned them up. I was like, look, does it, is this how it works? I'm like, yeah. So we sent all the stock to them. Then they picked, packed and sent all the orders out. Mm -hmm. So we did that. So then we didn't have to do any of that stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what, that's what we so did. Done all right then. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, yeah, just always thinking just logically, just like, how do I outsource as much crap as possible just to keep it simple because even you know in jumping forward a little bit to like even 20 20 no 2018 we did like six million we had three or four members of staff so throw, throw me back into the timeline in this so 2018 you said six million yeah uh, so we did what year did you start the brand we started in 2015 so yeah. year one we did a million yeah 2016 then 2017 that then jumped up to three million then 2018 we then did six million damn yeah that's a lot yeah <laughs> and what year did you sell the run 2021 it's only like recently basically yeah, yeah like year ago in october once again going back to the breakup right i don't want to constantly talk about breakups yeah yeah how long did it take for you to get over that breakup <sighs> probably a year like mentally because i i it's sad because i i even remember going to the shoot a year after and i remember being at that shoot and I wasn't happy. And this was a year of working my ass off, being yeah. at the shoot, and with guys from Geordie Shaw. Yeah. <laughs> I should be happy in this moment, and it just wasn't. And it, yeah, it's just in full like depression. It's just like, it took a long time to like feel like normal again, sort of thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to bring this back to business as well. So I don't, yeah, yeah, I'm that's cool. The fact <laughs> that, you know, but that obviously gave you fuel to your fire. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And as you got over it, what was it then at that point that was fueling you? to work harder and to keep motivated to keep going i'm not saying you know everyone has, has a breakup to fuel themselves i'm just saying i just want to yeah, know like, what I fueled you i think because i never look i never had that drive and fuel like had in that time and period ever mm -hmm. that was a very unique situation like i've never because you can't fake that like it's, you can't just wake up and decide i'm gonna have drive and fuel like yeah, yeah, yeah. you just can't yeah. <laughs> so it's just like i was lucky and fortunate enough that that happened i didn't ever have that level of drive ever mm -hmm. again so just like I had a high, I'm a very driven person. So naturally I work hard. I love work. I can work hours and hours a day. Like I like, I love it. So I think just seeing the business grow and I enjoyed it, it didn't feel like work. So I think that's what drove me. I mm -hmm. didn't feel like work. I loved what I did. So it's just like, it was very easy to stay on top and really work and put everything into it because I loved it. What was your upbringing like? Were you, were you like, were your family well off or what was your whole situation financially? No, nah, so like we just went to normal school. Um, it's just normal, just like, you don't know anything else, do you? Mm. <laughs> like it's just a normal upbringing, normal, normal school, all, all, all good. And then just went home, back to normal house and then just played football on the green or whatever with it's all your mates. normal upbringing then. Yeah, just normal upbringing. Yeah. I literally worked like, I was, even when I was like 13, I had a job washing up plates and stuff at local restaurants and mm -hmm. then i'd go to get a job at the co-op after went to hartbury college then i got a job at the co-op just literally just on the till and then i would literally even get a cleaning job before it even opened so i cleaned the co-op at five in the morning yeah then i would then go to work after it and then because it's just another way of making money so yeah yeah it's always like kind of driven to like work and stuff why like money i i, I if you, i think i even I so, look back at one of my tweets from like when I was like 2014 and said, I literally tweeted, I was like, I need money because I'm too good at spending it yeah. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> so I just like, I always like knew I just needed money. So, um, is yeah. that the reason why you started a business as well? No, it's, it was purely because of the breakup why I started that. And then it was just, um, I found it's just, what, it was what made good you, sorry, so to like, I'm, cause I'm trying to understand this, right? You know, yeah. you, you'd been working essentially prior your whole life before this, right? Yeah. Um, so what made you want to start your own business? Good question. And, and make money that way as opposed to, you know, I can just get back in a job and bang out more hours. I think it's because I wanted to do something really good for myself. Like, it's like, I don't know why. Like, it, I, I remember when I was like, just, I remember in the, my parents' living room, was on my own, just like in tears and stuff. And it was like, it was at that moment when I was literally made those two goals, like create a business and get in the best shape of my life. So it was just like, at the timing of it's like okay well i actually need these jeans 
like I want to make the I want to wear these jeans. So it's like a combination of oh, I've got a product, and then I start to look into you know how to make them and all this stuff, and starting a business. And then I just delved all my energy into that because it's just a massive distraction because I could work on it outside of work. But did you ever have any other experience in business or did you ever have a vision of, you know, starting your business before, researching to it? I was very entrepreneurial anyway, like looking back, it was like even, I remember, you know, when I was 10 or 11, like I wanted to watch WrestleMania as a kid and my parents were like, no, because it costs like 20 quid. So yeah. like me and my mate was like, okay, how do we get 20 quid? So we just went on the street and just washed cars. Okay. <laughs> so it's just like, there's tendencies and like the whole like, you know, selling sweets to school, I was that kid. Yeah. So just like looking back without even knowing. And my nan- So it was in you then? My nan even said to my parents, like he's gonna do well in life. Cause like, he just knows what he's doing. Like in yeah, terms yeah. of that, she, she saw that from yeah. like a very young age and stuff. Yeah, so it was in you all the time then? Yeah, I remember even my nan, um, bless her, she, uh, she was like, how are you making all this money? Because I'd come, I'd go to hers because you're going to be left home. So uh, yeah. I was like, um, she was like, how are you making this money? Because I'd like, what's the cash in my, my wallet? And then she was like, she she then went, to, uh, she's like, oh, I can go to Lidl and buy these products for you for cheaper. Yeah. So like she was buying like, cheaper sweets to sell at school. <laughs> See, stuff like that. Your suppliers were Yeah, then. she was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was just like, don't buy me. I can go to Lidl and just get loads. <laughs> did you, did you, and do you ever get motiv- by, motivated by the luxuries of life? For example, you know, you mentioned to me off camera earlier that you had a Eurus. Mm. Um, you know, f- fulfilling that sort of lifestyle, is that what? has allowed you to, you know, when you see results, you want to chase more and more and more because the more you have, the more you can nah, have cause I've, luxuries. I don't think not now because I've had that life for quite a while. So like, you know, I had that when I was like 21. So it's been like seven years of like doing all that stuff. So I've done it. Yeah. Um, and then you soon realize you get accustomed to it and you're just used to it and with or without it, it doesn't change your, like the way you feel sort yeah. of thing. It just yeah. doesn't really matter. None of it, none of it matters. You know, it's um, maybe like when, when you're younger, like, oh, I really want, the cars and that's what I did but yeah once you get it's like anything you you just get accustomed to it I think even watching Aleem he did a YouTube video saying oh you know you should be happy driving a Bugatti and stuff but eventually like when you drive over and over again it's not the same as the first time you drove the Bugatti yeah of course yeah so it's just like you know what I mean you get accustomed to anything <laughs> you um, and you know you'd think people who might be in my position or you know just you know wherever you are you'd be driving your car you'd be dreaming of the next step above yeah thinking that that's going to be everything you've ever wanted yeah give it a month after you've owned it and you realise I want the next thing. I want the next thing. Because it's, it's always the, it's the journey. Yeah, what matters. It, it's the journey that yeah. matters a lot more. Yeah. What was the most like outrageous thing you had probably purchased for yourself for the first for the first time? Definitely the orange Lamborghini. <laughs> so like I was like twenty one, I rented one of Aleem's car pet cars, and that just got me into like Lamborghinis. And then it's just such an impulsive decision. Yeah. Spent like which one did you rent of him? Uh, I didn't get to drive it because I knew a guy called Mark. So he'd drive, pick me up, and then we'd just go around town and just drive somewhere and just like take me around it and stuff. And then, yeah, uh, yeah caught the bug. And then I uh, went to see Carl Hartley. And then he was the only guy who'd actually, you know, finance the car for me. It was like, like, we can do this car for you. It's 90 grand up front. And then you can pay monthly sort of things. So like, fuck, okay. Which car? It was a Hurricane. Uh, yeah, it was an orange Hurricane, yeah. uh, which was my first car. And then got it. I was like 21, drove back to town and was like, fuck, where am I going to park it? Because I had no parking. <laughs> yeah. So it was just like, yeah, it's just very impulsive. <laughs> so how long did you have that for? Uh, a good couple of years. Then I was just in and out of cars, like different Hurricane Spiders, Hurricanes, Ferraris, Eurus, like just in and out, like probably Carl's dream customer. <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> Carl, if you're watching this, we need you on the pod, mate. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, getting the, getting these luxuries of life, how did that make you feel? When you first bought that Lamborghini, the first one, yeah? I just love cars. Like, it wasn't it, it wasn't to do with anyone, like, seeing it. It was like, I love sport cars. Like, the sound of them, driving them. Yeah. When a Lamborghini drives past, I'm in awe because I love yeah, cars. Yeah, yeah. And that, and I get, I'm quite, in, I'm very introverted. I don't like people looking at me. I don't like that at all. Yeah. So same. it's like, I, I'm quite uncomfortable. So yeah. I don't like going to Sainsbury's and parking it and then everyone's staring. I hate it. So yeah. it's like my favorite part about the car is being inside the car and hearing it. And I even prefer being outside the car and seeing it drive past because <laughs> you can actually watch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you can hear it more as well, if anything. Yeah, because I, I had one of, like, when I got the Ferrari for like a couple of weeks, I literally sent it back because like it didn't sound Which good. Which one did you have? It was the Spider 488 ones. Is the oh, one with the turbo. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can't hear nothing. Yeah, yeah, it's just like, I was literally driving, it's like, I don't even know I'm in a Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> like, so just I just like switched that. straight back to Lamborghini. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not in it for sports cars to so like, to look good. Because yeah. it's like, a Ferrari's amazing car. It's just car. personal enjoyment. The, if you think a Ferrari's an unbelievable car, like that gets attention. Yeah. I don't, I got rid of the Ferrari because I wanted a loud car. Yeah, you want something that connects with you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 100%. All right, just to throw it back to business, right? So then we left off when you made a million 
Uh, so you made a three and then six million, right? Yeah. So how did the growth of the company go after that? Uh, so yeah, it all went downhill. So like obviously it okay. just it just went like that. Yeah. <laughs> on top of the world, and then just went like that. Why? Um, so uh, was it a systematic failure within nah, the business? Or no? Nah, so like to condense it down because it's a long story. So like in 2017, it was. July 2017, had an offer from Superdry to buy 40% of the company because Julian lived in Cheltenham. So met him. They wanted to buy 40% of the company. And then I had these two sales agents who worked with us to, you know, manage our Selfridges account. Mm -hmm. They were like, because they felt threatened that if I went to Superdry, they would get cut out of the deals and they wanted to get in because they saw the potential of Harris. So like, yeah. don't go with Superdry, just meet this guy. So I was like, okay. Went to meet him. And then... uh they, they were just like, look, we're in the industry. We manufacture all the super dry coats and this stuff. And they're, well, they're, they're, they're in the industry. They're not like Joe Blog sort of things. Like, they're reputable. Um, Have they got their own brand as well? Yeah, you? they had their own brand. It's it pretty big. Well, even then, now? Not anymore. I think they sold, obviously, it was a big company. So they kind of like sold it. And he's old now. Yeah. yeah so then the, the two sales guys, like, meet these guys. So I was like, okay, met them. They're like, we manufacture all the super dry coats and stuff. We don't want any percentage of your company we'll just finance it all for you you keep full control mm -hmm. and all this stuff so and like, you had 100 percent control 100 percent, yeah and i was always wary of like giving up control and stuff and like losing it to a big company and whatever so i was like okay i did that basically i went down that road so was, then just to interrupt you there was this because i saw on your instagram that you posted that ben francis wanted to buy your company initially as well yeah so this is after after so okay. yeah so with they manufactured all the stock the selfridges guys they're nothing to do with selfridges they're just our agents for selfridges yeah they did all our buying for us because obviously this is new territory for, for me so it's like and you're being guided they're the first adults in the business mm -hmm. reputable one of them used to be from jd so like obviously has nothing to do with jd anymore so this has nothing to do with jd but the guy and all this stuff so um yeah they were doing all our buying so i was just going along with it because we, we like i said we were doing like pre-orders we never knew what the scene was so i was like you got a guy here saying, right, we'll give you two and a half million quid. Let's blow it up. We can make this amount of money. Black Friday's coming for November, December. We'll sell it. So I was like, yeah, okay. Like 21 years old, just everything was happening at miles, miles, miles an hour. So we're just like, okay, if you're telling me this is correct and all this stuff, I'll, I'll go with it. Mm -hmm. Again, my fault for agreeing to it. But when you're being guided by 40, 50 year old industry adults, you'd expect them to have your best interests at heart yeah because you probably extent. instantly because you you probably think oh they're older they might be a bit of a mentor you have well. to listen yeah 100 yeah. percent. otherwise you know who am i to, i've never been here before you guys have yeah so then and they're offering me two and a half million quid to do all this stuff yeah. so like but this wasn't the reason why they did it all um so then so what was going through your head they're offering you all this money and you keep 100 percent acquisition of your company so they owned they were working with the factories so like they they made all the stock November came, we shot with Sophia Ritchie, spent six figures on her to do a big campaign. We said to everyone, right, we launched in 1st November. All the stock wasn't in our warehouse yet. And then I had a phone call a week before we were supposed to launch saying, look, the stock's a bit late, going to be delayed. So I was like, oh, fuck, like, we promoted this date. So they're like, just put on pre-order again. Just put everything on pre-order. Yeah. So we put all on pre-order. We sold like 10,000 units straight away, yeah. like within the first week. Um, and then we had sold all these orders and stuff. And then, um, and then the, then I had a phone call from them. Well, a, a contract come through to me email, sixty page long contract. They were just like saying, "Look, just quickly sign it and all this stuff," um, because we need to release the stock to the warehouse and we send it to the customers. And they just thought I'd just sign it because I was under time pressure. Yeah. And then it turned to the blackmail. They're like, "If you don't sign it, we're not sending you the stock." Still didn't sign it. Sent it to my solicitors. Like, you cannot sign this contract at all. So it basically says. You know, you have to pay them two and a half million in 30 days or they take your IP. At the time, I didn't even know what IP meant, which yeah. is your logo. Yeah. Um, and you, you, if it comes late or faulty, then they're not liable for anything. I didn't sign it. They ended up having to send all the stock to me anyway. So they sent me the stock. I went to try it on at the warehouse. It was all down to like ankles, pretty much. Everything was like not even sellable. Yeah. Like it was terrible. Yeah. So I was in and the- And that was what, two and a half quick, quick, uh, million? Two and a half million pounds worth of stock yeah. with half, with 10,000 orders yeah. and customers kicking off, complaining all over social media and Trustpilot went to one star. Yeah. It's like, oh, where's all damn. my stuff? Okay, yeah. Destroyed the company and yeah. then 
had all this shit going on in the background, trying to negotiate with them, trying to get all these orders out. We had an order to go into Selfridges, mm -hmm. which was late. Selfridges were on my case, like, where's the stock? Yeah. It was, and I was 22 years old, going against all that. Yeah. <laughs> it's mental. And then, um, yeah, so uh, we sent all, out all the stock, had tons and tons of returns. Fulfillment bill went through the roof because obviously the returns and stuff, social media got damaged. And then um, turned into a 12 month legal battle with these guys trying to steal my company basically for 12 months straight, just saying, you know, they sent me winding up petitions to try and set the company down whilst I was still trying to run the company, mm -hmm. trying to rebuild the broken brand, what they destroyed. Yeah. Um, just claiming like, you know, you owe us two and a half million pounds and all this stuff. And just like, well, have you seen what you've done? <laughs> so like, at, at the point of when you first met them mm. and when you realized they're trying to screw me. Yeah. yeah? At, when, when you first had that initial yeah. instance, how, what was, how long was that? So it was when they sent me that contract, alarm bells started ringing. Because the day before, yeah. I went to watch the McDonald's founder film, yeah. where he got screwed out the deal at the end yeah, okay, by a contract. Okay. The day before this happened. Yeah. So I was already like in the back of my head. Bloody that hell, came, God bless you, that one. Yeah, it did. <laughs> and the second that contract came through, instantly I was like, that film's like, yeah. this is all fucking weird. And then, um, yeah, it was from that moment, I was like, this is just f fucked, basically. And it was obvious what they were trying to do because it's very, very smart. Like they could have acquired a six million pound business, which Superdry wanted for two million pound because I didn't pay them their two mil back. Yeah. And they would still buy my company for free yeah. and still own the two million pounds worth of stock and kick me out hundred percent. They're playing chess at a very high level. They would have robbed you fully, basically. Fully. Yeah. The whole company, if I'd have just signed that paper, they would have legally kicked me out of the company. I'd have left been zero. They would have ran her and they'd have kept the stock they made which was faulty on purpose, yeah. but they could have flogged it to TK Maxx, yep. got the money back anyway, and they've acquired one of the biggest streetwear brands ever in the UK at the time for within free. a two year period for free. That's mad. Yeah. And to think- And they've done it before. I so I've done many podcasts right now, so I know how business can be dirty sometimes as well, you know, from, from uh, other business owners that I've spoken to. But that's, that is on a, another level. Yeah, so obviously this was all kicking off in like December, January, where it's like they were sending me winding up petitions. And then luckily, you know, I had a good relationship with Ben Francis like before because Noel used to shoot for Hera like oh, okay. in 2016. So yeah. I met Ben and then I phoned Ben up. I was like, Ben, I'm in some serious, serious shit. Yeah. <laughs> like serious shit. <laughs> There's like next day, set me up a meeting. Like he's been, always been great to me. Um, met Paul and Steve for the first time told them the situation and they were like in disbelief. They're like, fuck, like there, no one orders two million pounds worth of stock as a three million pound business. Did they know We've of these guys? We, we, we turned over three million, yeah. yeah. They went and ordered two million pounds of stock at cost. Okay. It, it isn't, it's nuts. Yeah. But I didn't know any of this stuff. Like, I just wasn't educated. Like, did, did Ben and his team know about these guys? They didn't, but the, the other guys I spoke to did and yeah, so it's just like they got a reputation in that industry. Um, For doing the same thing. Yeah, so it's just like, um, yeah, I spoke to Ben. They offered to buy 75% of the company. Yeah, um, I wanted to keep control because I wasn't ready to let go of the company sort of thing. But lo looking back, yeah. like I regret not doing that because I wouldn't have had to go through a 12-month legal process yeah. with these guys. So Ben wanted to buy 70% before all of this anyway? 75% yeah. whilst this was all going on after like two months this was going on. Okay. But it would have got me out of all the legal shit. I would yeah. have had to go through it for a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would have taken it over. Yeah. I'd have been in a job there or I'd have ended up leaving. But it would have been a great long-term play where, you know, they could have leveraged all their customer base with Hera. Mm -hmm. And obviously they had the infrastructure, the money to line, into it. isn't it? Yeah. It would have been sick. Yeah. Like, it's stupid not Because then it. they'd have the gym wear on lock and the street wear on lock. Yeah, it would have been sick. Yeah. It would have been mad. And I wish I could see what how that would have played out because that would have been very fascinating. So why didn't you take it? I was thinking at the time I was, it was all about control. Like I just did not want it. Maybe it was to do with my previous relationships and like I clung on to it because that was it, maybe a psychological issue of like, you know, I don't want it to leave me sort of thing. And like, it didn't want, I just never wanted to let go of control because I was always scared. And bearing in mind, I've gone through this process with these guys uh, who tried to scream me. So like my trust was damaged mm. <laughs> massively. So I had my guard up all the time. I was like, who the fuck can you trust? And yeah. it's like all this stuff. So, but it's still risky because like that deal, like, yes, it's unbelievable. It was the best deal possible. But the problem is like, I would, I would have received nothing for the company. It would have just gone on to the debt and it would have been a longer term play. Yeah. So you'd have had to wait four or five years to hopefully they'd have grown it and then sold it and then made then the money get, that way. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. if it didn't work out, you'd then, still be on zero. Okay. But obviously 
it, yeah, it was all about control. So it's not exactly like you could sell it and then, you know, um, have some money come in from the sale of the company. Yeah, and I think for me, it was like so angry because like the company would have been valued at like 10 million yeah. before that incident. Yeah. So now it's been valued at two and a half, three mil. So like just because of this one bad business deal. So you're almost like robbed of your 10 million yeah. pound company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, That's crazy. yeah. And then, um, and another thing what stopped me from going with the Gymshark guys was um, I was speaking to another uh, big industry person. I, I won't say his name, but just a massive fast fashion uh, founder in Manchester. Yeah. Um, so he Found helped me him. out a lot. And yeah, it just felt amazing because like they're powerful, powerful people. <laughs> so it's like you're in a room <laughs> with powerful people who know how to play that level. Yeah. <laughs> like really good. So I was like, you know, had access to their legal team. They, Panoni helped me out for like six months, seven months, supported me through that entire process. Mm -hmm. They supported me through it. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it was just um, a big game of chess. So like they, those guys wanted at the end, 49% of the company, but they wanted to give me a loan instead of equity. And I was like, it's just not going to work because like, I don't want to have debt. Cause like, what's the point of giving halfway my company mm. just to owe you the money? Yeah. I wanted like what Jim Sharp was doing, but to like, you know, get rid of the debt. Yeah. So then I was like, okay, well, I just went along with that because I've tried to get the deal to change sort of to buy equity. Yeah. So then I remember it was like July. It was a week before the court case, before I had to go to court with these guys who were trying to take the company. Yeah. So I was like, I always go to Ibiza for my birthday. So then I went to, I was like, fuck it. If this is my last time I'm going to Ibiza. It's your birthday in summertime. Yeah, it's July 8th. So I was like, yeah. week before the court case, I was like, right, lads, we're going to Ibiza. Just, I just fuck it. Yeah. So I went to Ibiza, <laughs> had a great time. And then uh, I just remember phone, it was like set eight, nine o'clock in the morning, just got back or whatever. And I just remember phoning one of these sales agents on the phone. And I said, I remember it, it was literally outside the balcony, I phoned him up. I was like, look, because I knew everything I was telling the sales agents was getting back to these main guys, mm -hmm. everything, but they thought I was on their side still. Mm -hmm. So I was just feeding them what I wanted to get back to the, to the other guys. Okay. So I knew that. So I was playing them the whole time. So yeah. I, I spoke to him on the phone. I was like, look, if you think, you know, I don't know what's been going on and I, and I know you're all fucking corrupt and you're all part of it, you know, you're a fucking idiot. And think, you know, I said, you think I've been going through this on my own without having support? I said, you know, I've got a billionaire behind me. I'll see you in court next week. Yeah. Then hung up. <laughs> and then half an hour later, my legal team rang me up and said, what the fuck is, what's, what's gone on? Yeah. <laughs> like they're panicking. Yeah. And then they had a, they literally made a deal like that day to like completely sign off in a, a contract agreement to pay over four years, half a million pound a year. Um, without going to court? Without going to court, yeah. And I didn't want to go to court because going to court is like flipping a coin. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, there are two million. Yeah. I wasn't prepared to do that. Yeah. So I had, yeah, I was either going to go with the fast fashion guys, try and negotiate a late deal with mm -hmm. the guy who screwed me, or go to court. And there were my three options. So it went to the wire. <laughs> All three of them like went to the, the last wire and then I signed the deal in Ibiza. Um, but that was a nail in the coffin because, again, I wasn't... After you signed the deal, did you continue partying? Oh, I cried. Like, I remember being at Martin Garrick's just like in in Yeshua, just like, because I had the, like that year of pressure, like I can't even explain how horrific I can that was, bro. Yeah. So like uh, when it was like signed, I was like, oh my God, like the biggest weight off my shoulders, like yeah. it's horrible. And then, um, yeah, and then just went, did that. And then, I um, uh, can't remember what I was saying. Uh, just the whole deal you know when you sign the contract yeah and that was the, that, that was nail in the coffin for her like yeah. because I wasn't financially illiterate enough to understand how debt worked yeah. because I just thought oh great I've kept 100% of my company it's over now I can pay them 40 grand a month because it's 40 grand yeah. didn't understand about net profit and and all this stuff like if you think we were doing 6 million in revenue mm -hmm. fashion's 10% profit margin so you're lucky to make 500 grand 600k profit mm. let's say 5 well, technically we were doing 500K net. So yeah, something like that. We were doing 6 million in gross revenue. So when you net that down, you're making about half a million in net profit. Yeah. So 100% of our net profit is going, to is going towards these guys. Yeah. So when it's bootstrapped and there's no extra money, how do you grow? It's impossible. Because the only way you grow is by using your profit to grow, buy more stock, influence and all that stuff. What do you think? I know this, this might sound like such a stupid question, yeah? How do you think it would have played out and what do you think would have happened if you didn't watch that McDonald's Founders film? 
I'm not going to, I wouldn't have signed it anyway, but it was just a very big coincidence and it did like hit me more than it would, but I, I wouldn't have signed that contract anyway. But yeah, it played, it played that's right a, lot. Film. <laughs> a lot of people say that. <laughs> yeah. For real, because that is like, you know, when you have stories in business, all right, and you, it's, it's, it's sad because not a lot of people know this side of business. You know, everyone sees the glory and the success and, you know, people talk about the struggles and whatnot, but no one is ever spoken about the 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 people that lengths the, the length that people go to the dirtiness yeah. in business when you yeah. get to that level and how much of a, a madness actually goes on behind the scenes and how much nothing comes out you know i remember lewis morgan said skeletons <laughs> in the closet yeah. do you know what i mean yeah. it's, it's, it's mm. crazy yeah because because so. yeah obviously do you know obviously logan paul and stuff yeah yeah his best mate mike malak yeah. who's on impulsive yeah. he had a book written called the fifth vital yeah um by Riley Reed. Yep. Um Riley J. Ford, sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Riley Reed's porn star. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Riley, <laughs> Riley Yeah, Riley. Um <laughs> Yeah, oh. Riley. Um she um she she wrote his book. Yeah. And then she I spoke to her and she's like, Wow, your story's unbelievable. Like I want to write your book. Mm. And she's like a New York best time seller. She she said the exact same thing, like this needs to be like be a film. Yeah. Which is crazy. So think- she we she wants to write a book about the whole story. You gonna do it? Yeah, we're gonna do it. She's going through some like heavy personal issues at the minute, which I'm helping her through like, yeah. mentally with something what happened with her sister. But um, yeah, when when she's ready, then we'll do it. Hundred percent. Is she American or is she English? Like she's from America. In- okay. Yeah. So then, moving forward now, after all of this has happened, and you know, potentially almost being robbed of your whole entire business or what you'd worked for, mm. you decided to sell. Yeah. How did that all come about? Was that in the same year or just after? So. What what happened was, which is another crazy story. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's never ending. So like, um, just trying to get the dates all lined up. So yeah, it was like COVID hit. So 2020, mm-hmm. COVID hit. We were just selling jeans, t-shirts. That really affected sales. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't, at the time, it's like we were supposed to get spring summer stuff in. It's like, right, we're not doing spring summer because I just, I just know for a fact they're just going to shut the country's down. It's yeah. like, I'm not going to risk it. So we ordered no stock. So we had a really quiet period leading up to Christmas. Then obviously we had joggers and stuff and sweat stuff come in for like October. But um, yeah, so sales like dropped a lot and then it was tricky. It was hard. And then we missed one payment to these guys for the first time, like had one missed payment. It, so in three years, we had 100% made the payments. Mm-hmm. At the end of around COVID, when it was like times were really hard, we missed one payment by like a week. What was it? Uh, monthly payments. Monthly payments, like yeah. 40 grand. And yeah. then we paid it within seven days or whatever, or 10 days, whatever it was. Yeah. They then called the legal action in. Yeah. They're like, they missed the payment. They've been waiting stuff. for this moment, basically. They've been waiting for that moment. Yeah. We paid them for three years straight. Yeah. That one miss through COVID. Yeah. Bang, legal team on my ass. Like, we want, we, you missed it. This is the right in. We, we want the company. So then I was like, oh, fuck. Then I had a week to literally find whatever left was owed as like half a mil. Yeah. So then I used my contacts, spoke to Ben Jim Shark, spoke to JD in the style, um, people I knew, um, <clears throat> just anyone really. Just like, look, this is my situation. Like, I need to sell the company or like get investment. Spoke to Paul because um, he was just transitioning out of Jim Shark. So I think his daughters wanted to run something as well so it was, like, he he was always interested in Hera because of through Gymshark as well so mm-hmm. he was he was interested all of them were interested I had offers from all of them JD in the style what to to buy the company yeah yeah to buy the company they were all around the same amount JD like wanted to buy half of the company yeah. but they wanted me to run the company okay but I didn't it was down to Paul and JD at the at the end and the fast fashion guys again um but I didn't want to I, I I was just so tired at that point. It was like, I was exhausted mentally. So I was like, I don't have it in me to take it further because with, with the JD stuff, it's like, again, it's just like you're employed pretty much because like if you sell half company, you work for them now. Mm. I can't just go on holiday or do what I want Yeah, sort of thing. So I decided just to sell the whole company to Paul. And at first, um, you, I think it was either you told me or it was on your Instagram video that he bought 75 at first. Yeah, he bought 70% because um, I was like, you know what? You know, what if this does turn into something big? I'll just keep thirty yeah. percent. But then it, things started to change in the deals. Like I thought it'd be like 
built like Gymshark, like sort of professionally, like get people in who are, like experienced and stuff. But then it's just like, I had a gut feeling. It was like, okay, you, like it's more of like a family daughter thing. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, look, this is fine. Yeah. But I, I don't believe in the brand with the way you're marketing it sort of thing at all. Um, I might be completely wrong, but it's just my gut feeling and judgment from what I'm seeing. So I was like, look, I think it's just best. I just sell the remaining 30%. Yeah. All sweet. You you do what you want with it. I'll yeah. go. And look, looking back, I'm glad that happened because you're tied in anyway. So I can't start another brand. Can't do any stuff because you're tied into these things if you own 30% of a company. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I'd yeah. have had to sell it regardless. Yeah. So in six months, 12 months, I'd have had to, and Paul wanted me to um, put in that I couldn't start a company for like five years. I managed to negotiate down to like 12 months. Oh, so even but, after you had sold the 30%? Yeah, so I'd have had to sell 30%. Then from that moment I sold the 30, then the time kicks in where I can't start a brand. So I managed to get that down to like 12 months. Why, why do you think yeah, that that these guys don't want people to... Because I've heard it as well, where you know uh, someone sells a company and they can't start another company for, for X amount of time. Do you think that's because the person buying the company doesn't want you to even be competition? 100% to because when I start my new brand, yeah. which is coming out in two months it'll right. smash out into pieces <laughs> so, so 12 months is over yeah, 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 yeah. So, so like yeah that's why well, yeah, we'll talk about that in a second so yeah. then, so you had sold everything at this point yeah yeah was it a point was the debt still on you and did you not acquire anything from the sale say that again sorry so when you sold the company was it just to pay off the debt like did you get any no personal so, stuff so we well? paid paid off the debt i made i think it's like just under three mil mm. net and then yeah just had that liquid yeah. which was nice but it didn't last long <laughs> so how did it not last long <laughs> crypto so <laughs> yeah so never twist crypto, what did you do this is a, I know this is a complete different turnaround in the whole story so far for the audience <laughs> you so think, like, it, what's you going think on it's now? a happy ending yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's got the he's got the money yeah, yeah. <laughs> he just, he's got the money he can just live he's got happy. his new brand <laughs> yeah. everything we, we still got more steps to go downhill first but nah the universe will smack you in the face again <laughs> so, like, <laughs> so what happened yeah then? so so it, what it was because looking back like I'm extremely entrepreneurial. Like entrepreneurs have to have very high risk tolerance mentally yeah. to be able to even think that this is possible. Like if you think how risky Hera was yeah. throughout this entire journey, it didn't phase me once. Like, so I was like, I had very high risk tolerance. Um, and I was just like very into crypto, like watching YouTube, watching what all the billionaires are doing. Like this guy called Raoul Pohl, like he's very into crypto, Michael Saylor and all this stuff. Like they invest billions into like cryptocurrency and everyone did. Yeah. Like, and this was, I sold it in October 2021, just got the money in my bank. And when it's that amount, it just looks like numbers on a screen. Mm-hmm. And then you're a kid in a candy shop yeah. on eToro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you're seeing all these fucking coins blow up yeah. like 10, 20, 50, 100%. He's yeah. like, oh, this is easy. Yeah. And like everyone else is doing it. So like, this is the new thing. And when everything's, when everything's good, everyone's delusional and like mm-hmm. they're on fucking dopamine and it's all like nothing can go wrong. Yeah. And that's what I was in. I was yeah. like, receive this money put it all into crypto and there was like these billionaires and stuff there's people if you go into like youtube and stuff they generally invested 100 percent of their net worth into crypto like that michael saylor bloke has like four or five billion in bitcoin <laughs> so it's it's this it's not like fucking <laughs> kiddie stuff yeah no, when you see that you believe like if these guys are doing it yeah and i did believe in it because i was like you know what is a new thing like it, it so i went with it and then literally uh, went in went up a bit and then the thing was like around january everything crashed and it went down in half and Did then you put all three mil into it yeah okay. and it wasn't just that it was like decentraland some metaverse ones like high risk ones and yeah. all that stuff but the majority was in ethereum yeah and then solana which yeah. went down 90 <laughs> percent. yeah so um yeah a lot of the coins then the problem is when it went down in jan because i was mentally prepared for this anyway so i was like look i know how crypto works and all this stuff like it does it can go down in yeah, half course, yeah. just leave it alone and it'll go back up within six months anyway yeah but the problem is went down half but then the other ones went down i just remember looking on it i was like fuck it's down 50 percent. just leave it it's going to go back up so i just held on so it was like a hot like held it mm-hmm. so it's like it's going to go up just leave it but then obviously it just fucking got wrecked like it was, went down 90 percent Ethereum went down like 70 plus percent. Then all of a sudden you look at the account whilst you're still living with your outgoings and stuff. 
it's like all of a sudden like oh shit got like half a mil left yeah and then it's just like doing reckless stupid shit because it's like okay i need to get out of crypto because this is just going down even further because the whole market's ruined and it's not just looking back at i don't just blame crypto some of them obviously when it goes down 90 percent it's a lot but you know, if I didn't invest in crypto, I know for a fact I would have invested in tech companies. Mm-hmm. What I know, I'd, have, I'd invest in Tesla, Shopify, Facebook, and all that tech companies, like fan companies. Um, but even they're down like 70% year to date. <laughs> so like, you wouldn't have won. And it was bad timing, reckless. It, a lot of it's bad timing. because if I'd invested that money any other year, it would have gone up. But because this was probably one of the worst financial years in history, you know, it just went down like the whole market did. But, um, and another thing I remember in October, like everyone was talking about inflation is like, you know, inflation taking 10%, don't leave your money in the bank. That was the advice given off, you know, Ray Dalio, all the famous people don't mm. keep cash as trash and all this stuff. Yeah. Okay. Where'd you put it then? Yeah. Invest it into stocks. But the problem is inflation actually was a better option to lose 10% than yeah. losing 70% to the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have this. Yeah. I'm in it's the same. Hard. Yeah. So it's just like X, you know, it's finance is difficult and there's three methods. Like one, you need to know how to make money. I know how to make money. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm not worried about losing it all because I know I'll make it back. Yeah. I know how to make money. Second, you need to know how to multiply money. Mm-hmm. I failed at that. Yeah. And three, you need to know how to preserve money. I failed at that. So next time, I need to know how to preserve the money because you need to put in safer assets. Like don't put your entire net worth into any stock. Yeah. Like it's too risky because like not just crypto. You know, if, I think I've read a stat like if you invested in Facebook in 2018, you'd actually be down year to day, like right now, yeah. which is nuts. Imagine investing in Facebook five years ago yeah. and seeing your account, you made a loss. Yeah, it's crazy. So it's, it's it's high level stuff. It's not as simple as just investing in a company. It's, oh, Tesla's a great company, so you're just going to make money. It doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so like there's S&P 500 index funds, like stuff like that, just low risk stuff, yeah. property. You just need to keep money just in low risk, safe stuff. It's like Warren Buffett, like, Looking at his stuff, like in 2020, you got rinsed like by everyone, like in all industry people just like saying, oh, you're not spending your money because he had the most amount of money on the sidelines ever. Yeah. <laughs> and he knew what was about to happen. And it, and I've, in 2020, everything was just skyrocketing. Mm-hmm. He didn't put the money in. So everyone's like, oh, what are you doing? Like you're old, you don't know what you're doing. Next year, who's laughing now? Yeah. <laughs> He's clear, cleaning much, up yeah. everything yeah. whilst everyone's gone down. Yeah. You've got wrecks. Lost so it, the old timers yeah. know what they're doing. Yeah, 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 of course. But- and, and I think seeing crypto and stuff like everything going up 50, 100%, 200%, 400%, 1,000%, it distorts our generation's perception of how much a return you actually should be getting a year. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you're lucky to get eight to 10% a year if it goes well. So I think it has distorted everyone's perceptions about Well, you know stuff. what the thing is as well? I remember Tate said this as well. He said people who have made, who have been rich over, you know, overnight crypto booming, yeah. you know, for example, Luna or Shiba or whatever it was, and they put the whole net worth and they've made mm-hmm. one mil into 10 mil from one night. Yeah. Yeah. They don't know how to actually work. No. They've just made money from crypto. Yeah. Whereas you've got to give credit and amazing credit where it's due to people like yourself who have, yeah. who've worked and know exactly what it takes to build a brand, build a business, yeah. go for everything to, to get the money. It may be a harder way, of course, you yeah. know, there might be some crypto millionaires who have made money a whole lot easier compared yeah. to starting a brand, but put them in the same position that you're in. Would they know what to do? I'm not one to say, but argue, it's arguable, isn't it? Yeah. Like, you, you know, you never really know. Mm-hmm. So the brand you're going to make now, mm-hmm. what, what's all that? Can we talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. So chat to me. Yeah. So I've got the name. So I'm doing like a YouTube series. So I'm yeah. literally starting it. You're documenting all of this as well, document right? everything. Yeah, yeah. It's like daily. So like, because... Uh, Do you wish you documented everything? With, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You've been so sick. <laughs> Could you imagine? I oh, know. You know when I, uh, you know, like, oh, I had that God. idea about 20,000 <laughs> subscribers, I was like... Man, I should have vlogged the whole journey and everything like that. Yeah. So I didn't do it because I was like, I'm at 20,000 subscribers. The journey's already halfway done now. Yeah, now I look back at it and I'm like, oh, brother, I should have started vlogging from then. Hey, at least at 20k even looking, now. Even looking back, like stories like met Scott Disick, met like McGregor. Like yeah. even the story with McGregor quick. Like even in 2017, I knew who was going to um, a nightclub in Liverpool because it was yeah. Aintree. Yeah. So like Tom and mate's like, we need to go to this nightclub in Liverpool. He's yeah, yeah, we there. didn't even cover this whole story. Yeah. Yeah. So I took, <laughs> so I took a t-shirt with me. Yeah. Went to the club and then uh, he was like with his entourage at the top. So went over there, started chatting to some of his mates or whatever and his manager. And there's like, look, I own a brand called Hera. Would Connor do a post for me? Well, not a post, but just take a picture of the top. So yeah. um, next thing I know, we were getting escorted into the toilets with McGregor and his like security guys and his manager. Yeah. They kicked everyone out of the toilet. And then uh, just me, McGregor and his manager in a toilet. 
and then just negotiating with him. It's just mm-hmm. like, look, I own a brand. <laughs> However, like, would you wear it and all this stuff? Yeah. And then at first, like, we don't even know this fucking kid. Yeah. Like, no, like, and all this stuff. Yeah. And then, because um, I couldn't give him the money, because obviously, you know, I couldn't, Ireland, I couldn't just wire him the money. And yeah, yeah, yeah. something went wrong with my phone, something I just couldn't wire the money for some reason. And then, um, so yeah, he, I, I then eventually had to show him like reports on, you know, Shopify and stuff to, and that luckily there's articles about me, about my car. So I showed him a picture of me and my Lamborghini and stuff. Yeah. So that made me believe, obviously put me and my ID and stuff together. Yeah. So then eventually it's like, fuck it. Just his manager didn't want him to do it because of other contract stuff, but he was just said, fuck it, I'll do it. So he slung the t-shirt on, took the picture. And then uh, did it. And then the next day, had a phone call from like an island number, sat in the living room watching Love Island, picked up and it was McGregor on the phone. Yeah, <laughs> just, it was actually him. Yeah. <laughs> just saying thank you for sending the money. I really appreciate it. And yeah. all that stuff. And I was like, just, yeah, it was mad. But it's so, like his presence and stuff, like he has such an aura <laughs> about him. <laughs> like, and obviously I was watching all his videos in my bedroom, like about him talking about law of attraction and all this stuff mm-hmm. and, and all that his story and stuff. And then to think like I was watching all this stuff whilst building her and then two years later I'm in a toilet with him with him wearing my brand yeah like it goes full circle <laughs> like it's proper mad if anyone takes that that clip out of context it's gonna be a bit mad yeah <laughs> in the toilet of Conor McGregor what? yeah <laughs> <laughs> that that picture you got with Conor McGregor did you get any sales off the back of that or was um, that just because you just wanted him to be in yeah I just wanted to wear the brand like yeah. there was no strategy it wasn't how much stock we got and there's none of that stuff but open a massive door because um I think it was like a month later, he was about to fight Floyd Mayweather, yeah. which was the biggest fight in the world yeah. at the time. So I then flew out to Ireland about a month later, that happened. And then we paid him 50 grand to actually post on his Instagram page. So then he took a professional photo wearing a salmon t-shirt and then paid him the 50K. And then oh, so you you had met him after again to do actual proper shoot the door. Talent. Yeah, so yeah, like yeah, obviously yeah. In, in the nightclub, 25 grand for him just to take a picture with me with the top on. Yeah. And then opened a door with him, connected with him. And then um, flew out to Ireland, did another deal for 50 grand. And then he then wore the salmon tea um, and he posted it like three days before the Mayweather fight. <laughs> That's sick. <laughs> Which was massive. Yeah. That is the maddest thing it ever. Three years before the Mayweather fight. Yeah. That is when he most got the most track. Yeah. Most talked about bloke on the planet. Literally, literally. That's but that, this has all happened because I had the balls and I could have been, I like I travelled three or four hours to Liverpool at five o'clock with no notice. Yeah. Just in hope that he would wear the top. Yeah. You know, Can you imagine, not many like, people do that. you know, like you we're talking about documenting the journey. Can you imagine there's a clip of you like coming out <laughs> with with your phone, you know, vlogging it or something like that? Just came out of uh, a club in Liverpool, met Conor McGregor. Hera would have been even bigger. Yeah, because well, if, if you had vlogged it, the whole yeah, journey, like, if like I'd that. have vlogged the journey, because like people, I think people bought Hera because they knew the story in the journey. So yeah. it's like young kid people, driving a Lambo. You know, it's cool. Yeah, like, people it's just love like, buying from. Yeah, people. and I think looking back, if I'd have documented it, would have connected people even further to that brand. Yeah. That's like, why a lot of like, um, uh, you know, people do press runs and stuff like that because, you know, as these brands are getting bigger, people want to see faces behind the brands. Yeah. You know, you see Ben Francis, you also automatically tie Gymshark with Ben yeah. Francis, yeah. MDV with Reese, yeah. you know, <clears throat> et cetera. The list goes on and on and on. Mm-hmm. That's why people love it. You yeah, know? And if, if you vlog the journey and, you know, share the journey, then it would be even more crazy. Yeah. So this next brand then, what is it? So I can't say the name yet just because I'm going through like trademark stuff, which is so annoying because like you've got to pay money up front to trademark it all. So have you thought of the name and everything? Yeah, like? I've got the name. Okay, I've yeah. got the domain, got the name, yeah, got yeah, everything yeah. ready. Yeah. Just need to figure out a way about this trademark issue. Yeah. Um, I can trademark it. It's just, for me, I want to get money in. Mm-hmm. Like I don't want to spend money out. Okay. And that's the thing I learned from Tate. Yeah, yeah. So like that's the one thing he says. And that's the one thing I take away from him is like, get money in, don't focus on money out. So it's like, you need to get money in first before you piss 20, 30, 50 grand down the drain on legal stuff and, yeah. and all this other things. So yeah, I want to, and I'm documenting all like, you know, when I launch it and stuff and how I'm going to grow it and all that stuff. So yeah, that's, that's the next stage. Is it clothing line, yeah? Clothing, yeah. But I don't want it to be like a hero where it's like mass market and I don't want like a headache. Like I don't want a mass market, think of loads of products, like women's wear. I don't want that. I want it just to be like a more expensive brand where it's just like easy to operate it's just a cool hobby where it's just like a cool name, sick tees, sick products. And then people just like to be seen in the brand. So I'm creating a brand sort of thing mm. where it's just like people want to be seen in that brand where it's not like a mass market, mass produced load of product stuff. So then I'm going to throw it back to what you said about 10 minutes ago. You said your next brand, you're going to smash hero out of the park. Yeah. How? If it's, if it's not as mass market as that and you want to keep it just that almost like exclusivity element. 
Yeah. How are you going to smash so it? So this is this is the problem because like I'm deaf and I haven't even decided what I want to do yet because like there's two options I can go with it. There's either go down the Palm Angels road yeah. where it's like high luxury, mid like off-white Palm Angels, yeah. that price point yeah. where people still buy and wear it because they want to be seen in brands. Yeah. That could happen. But then I then get swayed back to be affordable. It would be more slightly more expensive than Hera because like Hera is like £30 t-shirt, £50 hoodie. Mm. It's like that sort of market but then the next level up is like Cole Buxton represent essentials where it's like 180 pound a hoodie yeah um 80 pound a t-shirt which helps with the volume side of things mm-hmm. a lot yeah you know they could sell three times less than Hera and make the same amount of yeah, money. money yeah of course yeah. so that's what I'm trying to work out the maths between like I don't want mass market because it's just like massive headache and I don't want that stress <laughs> so the process you've done so far have mm. you documented just haven't released it due to the fact that you know you want to keep everything secret so far and yeah so um, I've I've released a little bit but it's hard to like release too much because obviously I can't put my name like the the brand name yeah, on yeah, any yeah. Of stuff. so I'm they, yeah, figuring yeah. out the trademark issue first and yeah. then I can then so you I've can go kind full of, steam with it yeah I've got all the clothing ready and all this stuff yeah. so it's all ready I just literally need to sort the trademark thing out and then I built the Shopify website myself mm. so haven't spent money on an agency so yeah, I just kept costs really low, and then uh, yeah, kind of launched that. That's yeah. not bad then. What sort of um? Because obviously you took Hera very far as well, yeah. How are you gonna take this far as well? Obviously, with all the knowledge and experience you've had with that brand, and now putting it into this brand, where do you think you'd almost like? Uh, I don't want to say correct yourself because everything happens for a reason, right? Yeah. But where do you think you'd improve with this brand to make sure that nothing like that happens before uh, again? Yeah. Um, and also how you're gonna take it even further so i literally have no i'm i i'm not driven by any of that stuff anymore because mm. I, I don't care like yeah. I, i'm not even because i've done it i'm not in my mind like oh i need to make three six ten million i don't care mm. like I, I don't give a fuck <laughs> like i'm purely and it's taken me a year to even get to this stage where i even want to start because i've got so much past trauma mm. with the hera stuff and you know i had a recently a seven-year relationship end, and she worked with me at hera for seven years so that's very difficult to even go back into clothing now because if everything reminds me of her. <laughs> so it's difficult. <laughs> so like, I'm trying to just take it really slow. So I'm just doing it like really so, slow. So you had this breakup a month ago, as you were saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, By the time this podcast comes out, it'll probably be two months ago for the audience, just for reference, right? Um, How how does that make you feel and everything like that with, with everything that's going on? Like, I know breakups are tough and everything, yeah, but I mean like... Has it given you fuel to the fire again or mm. is it a different sort of, you know, what's it like? It, I, I'm a lot better Wait, mentally time, now. Yeah. So like it's, it's the version you get now is a lot different to the version you'd have had four weeks ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I'd have been in tears. So it's just like, it's, um, yeah, a lot's happened. Like, yeah, you mm-hmm. know, just went through like seven year relationship ended, worked together for like every single day with Hera. And mm-hmm. then, yeah, it's just like obviously... Yeah, for the past four months, four, four weeks been probably the hardest four weeks of my entire life. Yeah. It's just like, you know, that's ended. So you're kind of like adjusting to life with being on your own sort of thing. Like, yeah. you know, even the place we live together at, like I've had to move out of there because I literally can't be in that environment. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like, it's tough. Um, and yeah, you spend every day with that person. I mean, it wasn't just a relationship where, you know, the, they would go to work and I'd go to work separately. We went to work together at the same place yeah. next to each other. So if you think how much time we spent together in that seven years. It's a long time, so yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. It's it's so fucking it's difficult and hard to like get over sort of thing. But it's just I'm I'm a lot better mentally now because I'm just focusing on work, like just really focusing on myself. Like that's what I'm documenting documenting everything on social media. Like you know I want to gym, fitness, eat properly, everything, fitness, work on myself, my mind, um, work, business, set up a new brand, um, launched ashwhite.com, mm. which um helps people so you can join like e-commerce club for free it's like a free discord um and then you can um basically i'll just teach people how to start and scale the businesses and stuff so it's just a really good platform for people to just uh, link up network towards people courses on there and stuff yeah. and uh so yeah, i'm doing that which is nice it gives you more of a purpose because like i was like i didn't know what to do whether to go into clothing or i want i know i wanted to do a business so like seeing people on the discord thing and helping them out gives me a sense of like purpose and stuff. So mm. really enjoying that. And it's a nice balance between getting into a business and keeping me busy and not throwing myself straight into the deep end yeah, yeah, of, course, of yeah. Hera. So it's a really nice middle ground because it's a new industry yeah. versus fashion. Yeah. So I'm really enjoying that at the moment. Um, but I know fashion's my thing where it 
challenges me mentally. So I want to really do that. But instead of just like going like that with it, I've just zigzagged like mentally slowly, just take it day by day, just bits. If, if it gets too much, stop. You know, even with the breakup, like I was getting like panic attacks from just even <laughs> trying to work on it. So, like, and I've never had panic attacks before. So I, I've had, I get anxiety and stuff, but not never panic attacks. Like, cause I'm staying with my friend, Joe. Mm-hmm. So, you know, having to leave my apartment stuff because I just couldn't mentally cope being there, staying in his house, he's helped me out so much. You know, even going for a walk with him, like I just break down in tears sometimes and I couldn't breathe, like to have a random panic attack. Yeah. So it's just like, it's pretty mad. Um, but yeah, it's just, um, I feel way better now, like compared to what it was four weeks ago, just taking day by day sort of thing. And uh, like I said, just working on myself. What's the sort of message you want to leave out for the audience who are listening to this and watching this right now? Sort of message you want to get across? I think like it depends on what stage you're at like I think if you should always like do what you want to do and don't it's all like I'm big on self-belief it's like watch Will Smith videos really nobody knows who you are so like really challenge yourself and really push yourself and the one thing I find with relationships which is a key thing is like you get very comfortable and comfort destroys you like it makes you weak so just like it's only when relationships ended both times it's when you're on your own and then you truly know who you are and mm. it's, you truly push yourself because you've got no other option. And it's when you have that no other option, you can really excel in who you truly are. And like if, like I said, when I was 19, that didn't happen, I wouldn't have gone on the hero journey. Right now, if this one didn't happen, I wouldn't go on the journey I'm about to go on now. So I think, yeah, just really just push yourself and just um, find that balance, I guess. Ash? With that being said, I want to thank you very much for coming on the CEO Thanks, cost. Bro. I appreciate you traveling all the way down from your sides. Yeah. Two and a half hour journey. Yeah. And now you've got to go back there. So I appreciate yeah. you coming down. Yeah, no, really appreciate uh, it, bro. To do this podcast, man, and, and share what you've been through, man. Yeah, it's, it's been it's, mad. Yeah, it's been crazy. Yeah. Um, if you lot, people want to follow you, where can they do so? Uh, it's just ashwhite underscore. And then my website's ashwhite.com. I'm going to leave all the links in the description anyway. So make sure you leave a like on this episode. Try and get 10,000 likes. Make sure you subscribe if, if you haven't already. If you listen to some audio platforms, make sure you leave a review. Do all that sort of good stuff. And I'll catch you next week on the next episode of CEO Cost. Peace.